Hey everyone, welcome to Ballotpedia's webinar on 15 notable ballot measures and ballot measure trends. I'm Ryan Byrne, the managing editor of the Ballot Measures Project here at Ballotpedia. The general election doesn't just feature candidates for federal, state, and local offices, there are also ballot measures, a form of direct democracy. In November, voters in 37 states will decide on 132 state ballot measures. That's in addition to about 750 local ballot measures that Ballotpedia is covering, but today we're primarily going to focus on state ballot measures. This year's ballot measures address issues we also hear about in candidate races, abortion, voting policies, election administration, firearms, and marijuana. As ballot measures, voters will get to decide on some of these policies at the ballot box. Joining us today is Victoria Rose, a staff writer on the ballot measures team and host of our On the Ballot podcast which I encourage everyone to check out. Thanks for being here, Victoria. Yeah, happy to be here, Ryan. And to our audience, if at any time during the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we will do our best to answer them uh, towards the end, if time is permitting. So to jump in, Victoria, we selected 15 ballot measures to highlight. With 132 on November's ballot, how do we narrow down to 15? Yeah, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, we would have loved to include many more ballot measures, but we had to cut the list somewhere. So we figured 15 to celebrate Ballotpedia's 15th anniversary. Um, we thought about broader political trends and debates and how ballot measures can both reflect those and influence them. We also considered unique situations like record campaign finance in California or the first new state constitution in decades in Alabama. One of those nation level discussion, national level discussions is abortion. In June, the Supreme Court issued its Dobbs opinion, which held that the U.S. Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. This year, there are several ballot measures related to abortion, including some that are a direct, direct reaction to Dobbs or the idea that a ruling like Dobbs was likely. <clears throat> right, so in November, voters will decide on five ballot measures related to abortion. And back in August, some of you may have heard the news on this or may have been following it, there was a ballot measure in Kansas uh, and that ballot measure was defeated. And I'll touch a little bit more um, on that ballot measure as well when we uh, move along and talk about Kentucky. So with five ballot measures in November, that's six total for 2022, that's actually the most abortion-related ballot measures for a single year. Let's talk about two of those measures. First, Michigan Proposal 3. It's one of three constitutional amendments on the ballot this November that would establish a state constitutional right to abortion. While abortion has been a ballot measure issue we've seen most years since the 1970s, these right to abortion amendments are new. Uh, the other two amendments are on the ballot in California and Vermont. So, you know, we could have very easily highlighted all of these ballot measures um, because they're all, you know, they're all very notable this year, especially given uh, the legal context. But we selected Michigan Proposal 3 to specifically highlight for a few reasons. One, Proposal 3 is a citizen-initiated measure. The measures in California and Vermont were put on the ballot by legislators. Michigan currently has a divided government. Uh, Republicans control the legislature, the governor is a Democrat, and she's as well up for re-election this year. Uh, while Vermont also has a divided government, Republican Governor Phil Scott actually, he supports the constitutional amendment on the ballot there. And California is a Democratic trifecta, meaning that Democrats control the legislature and the governor's office. And third, the last reason, Michigan has a statute that bans abortion, uh, which makes the practical implications of a constitutional amendment um, more noticeable in Michigan than it would in uh, Vermont or California. Now, this statute has been struck down by a lower court in September, uh, but there could be efforts to appeal that decision. In other words, whether Proposal 3 is approved or rejected in November, we'll have a uh, the most practical consequences in the near future of these three constitutional amendments. So moving a little bit further south to Kentucky, Kentucky voters will also decide on a constitutional amendment related to abortion. Unlike Michigan Proposal 3, Kentucky Amendment 2 would provide that the state constitution cannot be interpreted to establish a state constitutional right to abortion. These types of amendments, as you may be able to tell from, from that language, are designed to address previous and future state court rulings on abortion that have prevented or could prevent legislatures from passing certain abortion laws. 
This isn't the first time that we've seen these, this type of amendment. From 2014 to 2020, voters passed this type of amendment in four states, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, and West Virginia. Earlier this year, in August, this amendment came up again in Kansas, or, or some type of variation of this amendment. Uh, voters rejected the amendment there. And some of the interesting things that we saw was turnout for that constitutional amendment actually exceeded top ballot races. So the number of votes for or against that constitutional amendment in Kansas were higher than the votes in the US Senate primary, as well as the gubernatorial primary. Now, there are differences between Kansas and Kentucky. While the Kansas Supreme Court ruled that the Kansas Constitution provides a state right to abortion, there hasn't been a similar ruling in Kentucky. Instead, Amendment 2 would have the effect of preempting a future court ruling of that nature. We're going to change gears and talk about this year's most expensive measure, and what are likely the most expensive ballot measures ever, uh, California Propositions 26 and 27. These two initiatives would both legalize sports betting in California. Combined, the campaigns surrounding these initiatives have received 427 million in contributions. A coalition of American Indian tribes is funding the campaign behind Proposition 26. And sports books, including BetMGM, FanDuel, and DraftKings, and some other gambling businesses are funding the campaign behind Proposition 27. Propositions 26 and 27 uh, differ in terms of who would be permitted to operate sports betting and how tax revenue from sports betting would be spent. Proposition 26 would legalize sports betting at American Indian gaming casinos and licensed racetracks, whereas Proposition 27 would allow online and mobile sports betting. Proposition 26 would enact a 10% tax on profits from sports betting at racetracks. The state fiscal analysis estimated that Proposition 26 would result in an annual increase of tens of millions of dollars in state revenue, of which 70% would be deposited into the general fund and 30% would be divided between the Department of Health and the Bureau of Gambling Control. Proposition 27 would enact a 10% tax on sports betting revenues and licensing fees. It would result in a revenue increase in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars, according to the fiscal analysis. Proposition 27 would allocate 85% of that revenue into a new homelessness and mental health fund and 15% toward tribal economic development programs. Propositions 26 and 27 account for over half of the total campaign finance for state ballot measures this year, and California on its own actually accounts for nearly 80%. Ballotpedia has identified 816.2 million in contributions to support or oppose statewide measures on ballots in 2022. In 2020, for comparison, nearly 1.3 billion was raised through December 31st, 2020 to support or oppose 129 statewide ballot measures. Around this point in October, 2020, uh, we had accounted for 918.4 million. Outside of California, oh, that's your question, Ryan, go ahead. <laughs> right, it's a really interesting number because the last cycle we exceeded 1 billion. I don't know if we're going to exceed 1 billion this cycle. Um, that may be due to the very fact that there are less ballot initiatives, even though there's more ballot measures, which we can talk a little bit more about later. Um, but yeah, Victoria, outside of California, what are some of the most expensive campaigns this year? You know, we often hear so much about California where they're very expensive, but where else are we seeing a lot of money spent? Well, excluding California ballot measures, the most expensive measures are Massachusetts Question 1 at $31 million and Michigan Proposal 2 at $14 million. <clears throat> Right, that makes Massachusetts question one the most expensive legislative referral rather than a citizen initiative on the ballot in November. What I mean by that is question one was put on the ballot by the legislature versus a lot of these other expensive uh, ballot measures were uh, through the initiative process. Uh, speaking of question one, Victoria, can you tell us a little more about it? Sure, so Massachusetts question one uh, would enact a 4% tax on income over $1 million and dedicate revenue to education and transportation purposes. The tax would be levied in addition to the state's 5% flat income tax for a total tax rate of 9% on income above 1 million. An identical measure made the ballot in 2018 through an initiative campaign, uh, but it was removed by the state Supreme Court, which found that the initiative had violated the state constitution, which prohibits ballot measures from mixing subjects that are not quote related or mutually dependent. This is Massachusetts version of a single subject rule. Uh, this constitutional rule does not apply to legislative referrals, however, 
uh, which is why question one in 2022 was placed on the ballot via the state legislature. Fair Share Massachusetts is leading the campaign in support of question one. Uh, they also helped sponsor the campaign for the 2018 measure. The Massachusetts Teachers Association, the National Education Association, and American Federation of Teachers are the campaign's largest donors. And donors to the opposition campaign, uh, the Coalition to Stop the Tax Hike Amendment, include Suffolk Construction Company and Fox Rock, along with some other businesses and individuals. And now to turn to that other measure you mentioned, Michigan Proposal 2. Uh, proposal 2 uh, addresses election policy and administration. Proposal 2 would add several voting policies and election policies to the Michigan Constitution. Some of these policies would be new, such as early voting. Others exist as state statute and would be codified as constitutional law, uh, such as the state's requirement that voters show identification or sign an affidavit to vote in person. As provisions of the Michigan Constitution, legislators would not be able to repeal or amend these policies without first passing a constitutional amendment, which would again require voter approval. Um, to provide an example that perhaps uh, helps highlight some of the practical implications of adding language to the Constitution. In 2021, the Republican controlled state legislature passed a bill to require voter ID, thus eliminating the signed affidavit option, uh, as well as to prohibit private funding from being used for election administration purposes. Uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, a Democrat, vetoed the bill. Under Proposal 2, in this situation, the legislature would need to place a constitutional amendment on the ballot to make such changes. So, for example, if there was a Republican legislature and a Republican governor who um, also agreed on uh, eliminating the signed affidavit option, if Proposal 2 passes, uh, the legislature would not be able to do that without, again, amending the Constitution, which would require a public vote. So you can understand that one point is a, a big point of contention for supporters and opponents, um, and that some people see that as a, a very positive thing and that it can't be changed without another public vote, and other people see it as um, interfering with the legislature's ability to uh, modify election law. Uh, another really interesting election policy ballot measure in November is Nevada question three. Especially following, some of you may remember, um, following the U.S. House special election in Alaska, Nevada question three, the system that it would set up would be somewhat similar to the system we saw play out in Alaska. So back in 2020, Alaska voters approved a ballot measure to adopt an election system that combined top four primaries and ranked choice voting in general elections. This system was used for the first time uh, over the summer to fill the U.S. House seat. Now, Nevada question three differs a little bit. And um, instead of using top four primaries, it would use top five primaries. Uh, ranked choice voting would again be used in the general election. So people would be ranking five candidates. Now, in Nevada, co initiated constitutional amendments like this need to be approved twice. So if voters do approve it this year, they would need to approve it again in 2024. If voters reject it this year, um, there will not be a second vote on the amendment. So in Nevada, it takes two elections to ratify uh, an initiated constitutional amendment. The campaign behind question three is Nevada Voters First. Um, it's received contributions from individuals and organizations associated with the Final Five Fund, which as you can tell from its name, advocates for this system of top five primaries um, and ranked choice voting general elections. Now, interestingly, uh, even though we, you saw the Alaska um, election play out, but in Nevada, the state's highest ranking Democrats, the governor and both US senators actually oppose this ballot measure. So there are a lot of election policy issues on the ballot. Overall, issues related to voting will be on the ballot in seven states. The other states include Arizona, Connecticut, Louisiana, Nebraska, and Ohio. In Connecticut, voters will decide on a constitutional amendment to allow no excuse for early voting. <clears throat> voters in Ohio will decide on a constitutional amendment to prohibit local governments from allowing non-citizens to vote. Louisiana will vote on a similar amendment at an election on December 10th. In Arizona and Nebraska, voters will decide on ballot measures to require or change voter identification requirements. 
Now to shift to another topic that also has a number of ballot measures this year, uh, marijuana. And the, the, the trend of marijuana ballot measures have, has been ongoing since 2012, if not 2010. People often think of 2012 as when uh, Colorado and Washington passed ballot initiatives to legalize marijuana. Um, but one of the really first high profile ones was actually a vote in California in 2010 where voters turned it down before uh, then passing it in 2016. Uh, Victoria, can you tell us where marijuana legalization will be on the ballot this year? Yeah, sure. Heading into November, uh, marijuana is legal in 19 states and Washington, D.C. Of those 19 states, 12 and D.C. had legalized marijuana through the ballot measure process. Uh, voters will decide on mar marijuana legalization measures in five states in 2022, including Arkansas, Maryland, Missouri, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, Missouri Amendment 3. So Missouri is the largest state to vote on legalization this year. Missouri, like the rest of the states addressing marijuana legalization in November, except for Maryland, is a Republican trifecta, which means that Republicans control the legislature and the governor's office. Missouri Amendment 3 is an initiated measure, meaning signatures were collected to put the issue on the ballot. Amendment 3 would enact a 6% excise tax on marijuana retail sales. It would also allow individuals with certain marijuana-related offenses to petition for release from prison or parole and probation and have their records expunged. Under Amendment 3, localities would also be allowed to prohibit marijuana establishments within their jurisdictions through a referred or initiated ballot measure. So while marijuana legalization has been a consistent topic in ballot measure world for some time, we've seen the recent appearance of ballot initiatives to legalize or decriminalize psychedelic plants and fun fungi. Uh, last cycle in Oregon, voters approved an initiative to legalize psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, within certain parameters, people could only buy and consume mushrooms at specific locations and under supervision. This year in Colorado, voters will decide on Proposition 122, which would allow for some other psychedelics in addition to psilocybin. Like Oregon, the consumption of these would need to happen at specific facilities. However, outside of facilities, psychedelics would be decriminalized. Uh, that actually is also the case in Oregon, but due to a different ballot measure than, than the one that I just discussed. Um, in Colorado, we see New Approach PAC, uh, an organization that has historically supported marijuana legalization measures as the top donor to the campaign behind Proposition 112. So some of those patterns may indicate that this could perhaps in the future um, follow a similar trajectory as um, the marijuana initiatives, but we'll have to wait and see how that plays out uh, heading into the future election cycles. So to talk about one more related to drug policy, but of a different sort, uh, in California, voters will decide on a ballot measure to ban flavored tobacco. Now, this one is a veto referendum, which is a particularly interesting type of ballot measure. In 2020, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill banning the sale of flavored tobacco products and tobacco product flavor enhancers. And then R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris, right, two of the, the largest tobacco companies in the U.S., <clears throat> they fund a signature drive for a veto referendum to overturn the legislation. Veto referendums have been called all sorts of names. Uh, in Maine, for example, they call them people's vetoes. So you can kind of get the idea of a, instead of the governor, you know, in the process of legislation, the governor vetoes a bill. So this is kind of a, a ballot measure to veto a bill that was passed into law. But the bill is essentially on hold, right? So the bill has been passed, but it's on hold until voters decide whether to uphold the bill or to repeal it. And since that signature drive was successful, it's now on the ballot as Proposition 31. So I mentioned who was uh, you know, behind the signature drive, but there's also a campaign advocating to uphold this bill. That campaign has received contributions from Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, as well as New York City Mayor, former New York City Mayor, uh, Michael Bloomberg. We saw something similar play out in 2018 in San Francisco, where there was also a referendum on the ballot. Uh, in 2017, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance that banned the sale of flavored tobacco. R.J. Reynolds launched a veto referendum campaign to repeal the ordinance. Voters approved the proposition, thus upholding the ordinance. And again, in that case, um, Michael Bloomberg was one of the top contributors to the campaign to uphold the ordinance. 
On to the next topic, two states are addressing firearms related measures this year. Victoria, can you tell us about Oregon Measure 114 and Iowa Amendment 1? Sure, so Oregon Measure 114 would create new permitting requirements to purchase firearms and prohibit ammunition magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds. Persons who violate the magazine's limit could be charged with the Class A misdemeanor, which is punishable by up to 364 days in jail, a fine of up to $6,250 or both. Under Measure 114, firearm purchasers would need a permit from local law enforcement. Obtaining the permit would require photo identification, fingerprinting, a criminal background check, and training on firearm law laws and safe practices related to owning, transporting, and using a firearm. Since 2000, voters have decided on eight measures related to firearm regulations, approving seven and defeating one. The last firearms related measure on the ballot in Oregon was in 2000 when voters approved measure five. Over in Iowa, voters will decide on amendment to add a right to keep and bear arms to the state constitution. This amendment would declare that this right is a fundamental individual right and that restrictions on this right would be subject to strict scrutiny. It takes two legislative sessions to get an amendment on the ballot in Iowa. And during both uh, legislative sessions, Republican legislators supported and Democratic legislators opposed Amendment 1. So far, 44 states have some version of a right to bear arms in their state constitutions. Three, Alabama, Louisiana, and Missouri, include provisions requiring restrictions to be subject to strict scrutiny. Generally, in court cases, that just means that a new law or that the law needs to have a compelling state interest and be narrowly ta tailored to achieve that interest. All right, before we wrap up, there are several other ballot measures I wanted us to discuss that don't necessarily fit nicely into these trends, right? Um, <clears throat> but a lot of them do reflect uh, national conversations and debates. So Victoria, in Massachusetts, there is a veto referendum, another veto referendum uh, on a law related to immigration and citizenship status and driver's licenses. Uh, can you give us some background here? Sure. So question four is a veto referendum on House Bill 4805 which would allow people who cannot confirm citizenship or immigration status to submit certain forms of identification to obtain a driver's license or motor vehicle registration. Uh, Governor Charlie Baker, who's a Republican, vetoed the bill, but the Democratic controlled general court, their state legislature, overrode his veto. Opponents of HB 4805 collected signatures to place the bill on the ballot. So before question four, there was one veto referendum related to driver's license for immigrants who cannot provide proof of lawful presence. Um, this was in 2014. It, voters rejected Oregon Measure 88, which had the effect of repealing the bill. Um, Oregon ultimately adopted this policy, however, in 2019. Great, thanks Victoria for providing some background and context there. So here's another one that I find pretty interesting, Nebraska Initiative 433. It addresses the minimum wage. So since 2002, voters have decided on 21 measures to increase state minimum wages. And every single one of them was approved by voters. Now, this initiative would increase the state's minimum wage to $15 an hour beginning on January 1st, 2026. After 2026, the minimum wage would be adjusted each year based on the consumer price index changes. While there are a number of states that have adopted uh, a $15 minimum wage, Nebraska is actually only the second state to directly vote on initiative to do this. The other one was Florida in 2020, where it was approved. Some of the interesting things about Nebraska, though, is that this policy, uh, in terms of legislatures, has largely been adopted in the Northeast, the West Coast, and then, of course, Florida because of the ballot measure. Uh, in the central part of the U.S., uh, Illinois adopted this through the legislative process. But Nebraska is kind of the one of the, the first states that's centrally located as a Republican. Um, well, I shouldn't say trifecta per se, right? Because um, Nebraska only has one legislative chamber, but you guys know what I mean. Uh, Republicans control the legislature, control the governorship, and they're voting on this ballot measure. So it'll be really interesting um, within that context to kind of see, does this play out differently in Nebraska than it has in other states with, um, with voters? Now, to round out our top 15, let's talk about a new state constitution. This is perhaps one of those things that's not incredibly exciting unless you're the political type um, who loves these types of factoids, but 
Alabama um, will be voting on a new state constitution, and it will actually be the first new state constitution uh, since 1986. So in 1986, voters in Rhode Island um, approved a new state constitution. So this one would have the, the glorious title of the Alabama Constitution of 2022. Victoria, what else can you tell us about this Alabama Constitution and the ballot measure? Well, the current Alabama Constitution was adopted in 1901 and has been amended 977 times. Uh, changes include rearranging and consolidating provisions and deleting repetitive language. A committee was formed uh, to recompile the Constitution, and it was authorized to propose repealing the language determined to be racist. The final document would repeal language prohibiting interracial marriages, requiring separate schools for white children and children of color, allocating revenue from poll taxes, and allowing involuntary servitude as a punishment for crime. So before placing the Alabama Constitution of 2022 on the ballot, legislators approved the document via a voice vote in both chambers of the state legislature. Great, thanks, Victoria. That, that actually wraps up the 15 ballot measures that uh, we also discussed in our promotion um, about biggest top 15 ballot measures this year. So Victoria, thanks for helping us unpack those. And thank you, Laura, and our communications associated for developing the, the presentation. Um, I think we have a few minutes left, so we perhaps can take um, some questions if anyone has any. Um, I do see a few here. So, Victoria, I, I have this, I'll, I'll read this one to you. Okay. Um, are there any ballot measure trends we see carrying on into 2023 or, you know, the future, 2024 and so on? Uh, well, the first one that comes to mind is marijuana legalization. Recently, actually this past week, a initiative in Oklahoma was certified for the ballot on March 7th, 2023. This initiative had originally targeted the 2022 ballot, um, but due to deadlines, wasn't able to make the November ballot. So the, the governor has uh, placed it on the March ballot. So this is, I don't know, the last time Oklahoma had an odd year ballot measure, um, but the first in a while and carrying on that trend of marijuana legalization, some uh, um, some other states that could possibly do the same are Nebraska. Uh, proponents who had orig originally targeted the 2022 ballot, but ultimately did not make it, have already filed for the 2024 ballot and are currently collecting signatures. And then there actually are some ballot measures that have already qualified in California in 2024. Uh, the topics include Pandemic Early Detection and Prevention Institute. We've seen a lot of ballot measures related to pandemic related policies, this being one of them, um, an $18 minimum wage increase, and then finally a new process for remedying labor violations. So these are the topics that we're looking at ahead. Cool, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think um, you mentioned COVID and I think that's a really interesting context here as ballot measures. Uh, we've seen a number of ballot measures <clears throat> kind of in response to COVID, whether in response to the pandemic situation itself or in response to the policies, regulations, executive orders, and so forth um, uh, surrounding all that. So some of you may know that back in 2021, Pennsylvania voted on two constitutional amendments related to the um, uh, emergency declarations and kind of the legislature's um, role in approving those or repealing those, rejecting them. Uh, in 2022, you know, we have several as well. None of them are necessarily uh, similar to the ones that we saw in Pennsylvania, but a number of them are reactions to things that happened, uh, again, whether with the pandemic itself or with regulations kind of surrounding it. We have um, a number related to legislatures being able to call themselves into special sessions. Uh, a lot of the arguments made by sponsors around those ballot measures have, you know, cited the COVID pandemic and the frustration of legislative leaders not being able to call themselves into session if, if you know, they wanted to have more of a role in the response. Um, in Arkansas, we see, uh, we saw one related to religious freedom uh, and kind of the state's ability to regulate things uh, around that. You know, specifically, you may recall um, conflicts around like um, church meetings and uh, all that. And, um, yeah, that about covers them. You know, there's an election administration change in Alabama that may be related. I haven't seen too much commentary there. 
Uh, but in Alabama, they actually have a constitutional amendment on the ballot this November that would prohibit any changes to election uh, administration law um, within six months of the election. And you may recall that, um, especially in 2020, there are a lot of uh, election policy changes either by legislative action or, or by executive orders. Um, so this would prevent stuff like that uh, within six months of the election. Ah, okay, well, Ballotpedia ever do college campus YouTube videos asking college students about political issues and candidates? Thank you for that question. You know, I'm not sure with ballot measures. I don't foresee that in the in the near future necessarily. Um, it's an interesting thought. But does Ballotpedia have a podcast? You know what, Victoria, I'm going to turn that one over to you. Uh, we do have a podcast that recently launched over uh, Labor Day weekend, September. It's called On the Ballot, and it is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you could just Google it on the ballot, Ballotpedia, it'll pop up. Um, and we release episodes every Thursday currently, and there'll be some special episodes coming out around the election. So subscribe and listen in. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It's a good plug. <laughs> Victoria is the host, of course. So I definitely encourage everyone to listen. Um, <clears throat> we talk about ballot measures sometimes with so many topics addressed as well with, uh, with all the other things that Ballotpedia does. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So, you know, Victoria, I think uh, I can take this one. It's one that I've uh, covered before. So thinking about the breakdown of initiatives and referred measures this year. So there's actually only 30 initiatives this year. Those are the ones where people collect signatures to put the issue on the ballot, um, which is the lowest number in a while, uh, at least in the previous 12 years, but um, could be even, even longer out. There could be a number of reasons for the low number of initiatives. We've seen this number declining uh, since 2016. It's gotten a little lower each year. Um, <clears throat> this year, a lot of the campaigns um, and news articles that I saw about campaigns that, you know, were collecting signatures, but didn't make the ballot. A lot of them discussed the labor shortages with signature collection. And signature gatherers are often paid. Um, some states allow them to be paid by the signature. Other states kind of require a more hourly uh, system. But something campaigns noted, uh, other campaigns noted that, you know, that a lot of campaigns based on the deadlines were collecting signatures in January and February. Uh, which is kind of when that Omicron variant kind of came through and may have caused a lot of uh, issues with signature gathering or, or just being able to access people, maybe not as many people out in public. Uh, some campaigns have cited ch recent changes in ballot law that we've seen in some states that may uh, have affected the process um, for them. So of, of the other types of measures, that's so 30 initiatives, but we have 110 referred measures uh, on the ballot which is actually slightly above the average. So you, you see uh, less citizen initiatives, but more amendments, um, more state constitutional amendments being put on the ballot by state legislatures. All right, well, you know what? I think that is probably as much time as we have for questions. So just to kind of close us out here again, thank you, Victoria. Uh, for helping navigate the complicated world of ballot measures. Thank you, Lauren, for helping develop the presentation. Uh, so just kind of to give us some closing statements here, you know, Ballotpedia is a nonprofit. It relies on donations for all that we do. So if you like our work and want to support us, uh, please consider donating if you can by going to www.ballotpedia.org backslash donate. You can stay updated on what we're doing by regularly visiting our homepage, ballotpedia.org, where you can find the latest political news and links to our major coverage areas and analyses. Another way to stay informed is through our newsletters. We have a whole bunch uh, which cover topics ranging from election policy to the federal courts, one on ballot measure certifications that comes out monthly, and a lot more subjects. So there's a link on our homepage to a full list of our newsletters. All right, to all of our guests, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for watching and coming to learn more about ballot measures. Hope you all have a good couple of weeks heading into the election. Thank you.